All right. Welcome. Well, welcome to the replay if you're here late. Uh, but uh, if, you're, if you're watching us on online here, we are uh, live streaming as well. We are here and we're, of course, you know, uh, live on Zoom and excited to be talking about uh, today's topic, today's community table session. <clears throat> we're going to be diving into the uh, the five pillars of consistent revenue, <clears throat> excuse me, the five key pillars of consistent revenue growth. Easy for you to say, right? Yeah, exactly right. <clears throat> I'll tell you, all of a sudden, it was like something caught in my throat. But uh, but yeah, so we are going to be uh, we're going to be having a, having a, a good conversation here, talking about uh, how to kind of develop some consistent revenue over the course of this year and and for many years in the future. If you get these are the five things that if we if we need to start uh, need to start kind of addressing and need to and and we're able to, to to kind of crack the code on so to speak, then we'll be able to to see uh, consistent growth here. You know, for for long for years to come too. So not just in 2022. So um, we'll let uh, let some people kind of funnel in here and give it a couple of seconds before we do our official um, official introduction. But I'm glad that people are here. It's good to see some familiar faces and uh, see some new or some some familiar names anyway, and some some new names as well. <clears throat> um, and you know it's funny every time that we go through one of these, I, I my my performing days all of a sudden come flooding back to me, because I, I I'm all of a sudden very very aware of of, of any sort of dead air that I may <laughs> <laughs> that I may leave, and so it's like I can't stop talking. But that's what made me a pretty good MC once upon a time, I guess. Right. We should have a, a joke ready to go just to fill. Yeah, it. right. <laughs> Don't play exactly. your dad jokes, but nobody's interested in my dad jokes. Yeah, right. Exactly. Hey, man, I, I've got a full, you know, a full Facebook feed uh, that I've curated to be focused on dad jokes and music. And so, uh, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we'll uh, we'll kick things off here. Uh, for those of you who, again, will, people are still funneling in here, but I do want to say thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, like I said, today's community table discussion is focused around the five key pillars for consistent revenue growth in 2022. Uh, my name is Ian Campbell, and I am the CEO of Mission Suite. And joining me here, as always, is Dean Isaacs. Dean is the founder and CEO of Vantage Group. Uh, Dean's a serial entrepreneur. He's got over 20 years of hands-on business growth and sales and marketing experience. He works with B2B companies across the U.S. that range from startups to the Fortune 500. Uh, he loves helping small and mid-sized businesses achieve their growth goals by developing and implementing high-impact sales, marketing, and growth strategies. Um, Dean, if that's changed since uh, I, I don't know that I've actually updated your bio since we first started doing this a year and a half ago. So you know, it's that's time. It's time. I was going to say, you may have to, <laughs> to let me know. Um, before we jump in, just real quick, I want to uh, address a couple of housekeeping items. Of course, we are being recorded. <clears throat> um, and as you know, as I'm sure the Zoom alerted you to when you joined. And we are also streaming live on Facebook. So if you uh, if you get a text message or a phone call frantically from somebody who's itching to get on this webinar, then uh, you can you can direct them to the Mission Suite Facebook page. Um, and of course, we'll be sending out the the replay of this uh, tomorrow. Uh, a link to to uh, it'll be live on YouTube on Mission Suite's YouTube page. I know that uh, that Dean uh, oftentimes does something with it, so we'll you know you'll see it on his his pages as well. So, uh, so, you know, like us, follow us, friend us, find us uh, on socials, and you'll see this and, and be able to direct people to this as well. Uh, obviously, we're always taking questions when it comes to this stuff. So if you do have questions, uh, do me a favor and just use the Q&A uh, function in Zoom as opposed to the chat, because that does help us to kind of keep all the questions contained and uh, make sure that we know which ones we've taken care of, which ones we're going to answer live and so on and so forth. So. <clears throat> um, but uh, but yeah, so I am excited to get started here. Uh, first things first, we actually developed a poll 
uh, for this because there are some faces, there are some names on this list today that I don't recognize. And so I just want to make sure that as we are talking to talking about this, that we are kind of focusing in on this on the right thing. So we want to know a little bit about who you are and you should see that the poll launch has launched live there. I uh, kind of want to know who you are and, and what you're doing. So, I want, you know, are you a consultant? Are you a solo practitioner? Are you a salesperson for a company? Uh, are you uh, a sales leader? Are you running a company or a sales team? Um, you know, those types of things. So, uh, so if you could just let us know, it looks like, uh, looks like we are focused primarily on consultants and solo practitioners. Um, we've got, uh, we've got somebody, we do have somebody who is running, uh, running a sales team, <clears throat> or at least uh, has a salesperson working for them. Um, we've got a couple of people who are also uh, salespeople as well. So thank you for, uh, for, for joining that, uh, for letting us know kind of who we're talking to. That, that's, that's really helpful. So um, we're probably going to be talking a lot about what one person can be doing. Uh, throughout the course of this and so because we do have again the the majority of who we're talking to the majority of the people on the on the call today are kind of in that consultant solar practitioner realm um, but you know Dean you can uh, you can kind of as you need to or as you think is is beneficial you know kind of shape what you're saying to, to be to be applicable to a salesperson right because that's yeah, going to cool. be can be a little bit different at times or a sales leader. And obviously if you have, if, if, uh, if anybody that does fall into that category has any questions, uh, definitely, you know, definitely speak up and uh, fire off a question in that Q and a uh, Q and a stage there. So um, with that, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to let Dean start talking um, <laughs> because I've been going for a while, but, uh, but as we do here, I want to know kind of just, to kind of help us frame the conversation, Dean. So we're talking about the pillars of revenue growth. When you say something like that, what do you mean? Like, what are we talking about here when we talk about the pillars of revenue growth? Yeah, so I will, I'll start out by saying this isn't just a sales-centric conversation, right? There are a lot of things that have to happen for us to go from no revenue to revenue. Uh, and, and so we can't, we're going to cover some marketing kind of stuff, some sales topics and some things that maybe feel like they fit in between. So kind of keep that in mind. But when I think about the five key pillars of consistent revenue, what I think about is the clients I've worked with over the years, the businesses I've seen typically have one or two primary things they do to generate leads, business, revenue, and clients. And that's fine to a point because if this random thing happens like a pandemic, hits and your leads only come from trade shows you're kind of hosed so you've got to be able to spread out the activity you've got to have more than one person kind of involved in this whole revenue cycle thing and of course the business has changed a lot right how we go out and acquire business how our prospects search for or make buying decisions has changed in the last two years um so i there are five key areas of sort of activity I believe all businesses, even solo entrepreneurs, need to focus on. So we're going to touch on each of those five and then really pick out two or three things from each. You know, we could probably spend an hour on each of these five. But my, my hope here really is for everybody that attends today to come away with one or two or three aha moments. Like I need to spend some time on doing that thing. Mm -hmm. There may be some other things that we talk about. But like I do that. That's kind of elementary. Sure. Well, sure. maybe to you, but maybe the other 50% of the audience, not so much. So that's kind of what we're going to be focused on today. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, you know, and you mentioned even solo practitioners, right? I mean, looking at this list that we kind of came up with, I would say especially solo practitioners and uh, individual consultants have to have these five things at least a little, they have to be active at least a little bit in these five things, right? I mean, isn't that probably, is there anything in here that you would say that a solo person can kind of get away without do it without doing these days because i'm looking at this and it seems like it's just i mean all these things at least need to be hitting a little bit yeah i would the easy answer is no right you got to do it all <laughs> right <laughs> but the truth is i think it depends on your business mm -hmm. and your target audience and who are you prospecting and where are they hanging out and sure. how are you going to interface with them too so there may be things that have a higher rate of return in terms of activity and resources 
and we'll, we can kind of dive into that. I'll give you just a quick example, social media, right? right? When we say social media, your mind may go to any number of platforms, but most people on this call are probably not going to use Pinterest to build their brand. But I would hope that most of the people on the call will be active on LinkedIn, for example. Mm -hmm. so you've got to kind of like weigh your activity and, and where you spend your resources. And that's something that hopefully at the end of this call today, we'll be able to kind of define what are my high priority activities that I'm not doing? And what are the things I could maybe push out a little further or even outsource too, right? right? You don't have to do it all yourself. Absolutely. And I think an interesting point of this is going to be finding ways that we can kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone, right? Because I mean, you look at like, you know, things like, and just so that everybody is clear, we're talking like the five and obviously the five key pillars that we that we just that we laid out in the description to this are sales pipeline management, current client growth, active referral program, email list and database and digital marketing and social media. And those last two things can really kind of be be pulled together into one activity just split into two different outputs right so i think i'll be interested to hear kind of ways that we might be able to blend some of those together too yeah yeah they can be blended or they can be blown apart and be a ton of activities on their own right just Absolutely. digital marketing is this such a kind of a big blanket term it right mean a lot of different things so yeah i think that we just got to go through this process and figure out What's the highest and best use of our time? Where are we going to get the best results? But also, mm -hmm. if there's some low-hanging fruit that you're not doing, that's, yeah. that's a big win opportunity right. for, for everyone. For sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, very cool. Well, let's let's dive into these things here, you know, and uh, and, you know, let's start with uh, with the first one. So we talked about, you know, kind of just going down the list here. So sales pipeline management. Um, yeah. First of all, what are we talking about? Yeah. So this is like the fundamental sales activity stuff, right? So sales pipeline management to me is all the things that you do to interact with a lead, a prospect, an opportunity, all the way through the process from lead to close. It actually goes beyond that and sort of like the lifetime value in interaction with your clients, but that's another separate bullet point. So that's what we're thinking about from you, when you've identified a lead, all the things that need to happen to get to revenue. That, and then how do you manage all of those activities? And, and especially if you're a, a solopreneur, you're a subject matter expert that is now reluctantly in a sales role, right? Because if you don't sell, you don't do consulting, you don't right. sell and make money. So that can be a scary, the, the S word can be a scary word for a lot of subject matter experts. And so I, I really think that You've got to change your your paradigm when it, when you when it comes to selling, and it's it's nothing more than having conversations. Mm -hmm. Selling is conversations. If it's if it's trying to persuade and push, you got sales wrong, and that was maybe what it was like a decade or two or three ago when mm -hmm. we had to come in hard and strong. Buyers are so more informed, and they're further into the decision making process. We've talked about this a lot over the last few months. They're more informed because they have access to information that you put out online. And so you can't push them in any particular direction that they don't want to go. Mm -hmm. So think of it in terms of sales, is it, think of sales in terms of conversations. And so the biggest thing, so this is the first takeaway for everybody. The one thing that kills more deals or leads to more opportunities lost than any other thing in the sales process is poor follow-up. Mm -hmm. So if you follow up consistently, if you have a process for following up consistently, you will, just by the nature of the way things are, you will close more deals. Right. Right. So when I, when I say follow up, I, I'm really talking about understanding each step of the buyer's journey. So we have to be empathetic in selling these days. We have to understand what the buyer's going through and they don't want to be closed. They want, to be, they want to learn and be educated and build trust and understand how we're going to work together to achieve this common goal through this journey. And so making sure you know what each step in the buying process is, and buying process is far more important than our artificial selling process, right? Um, and, and the follow-up for each step. Your goal is just to move them to the next step in the conversation. So that's what I mean by follow-up. But even when a lead comes in, let's say you're, you're, you've figured out a way to generate leads on your website. The speed that you respond to that lead is really important because if mm -hmm. they're looking at demoing Mission Suite 
-hmm. They're probably looking at demoing some other stuff too, right? Right. And so the reps that respond quickly, get them on a demo, get the conversation moving, have a high likelihood to win the deal versus someone that's like, no, we'll get to it next week. It's fine. Right. So just that fundamental follow-up quickly and consistently and have a process to do so changes changes your outcome big time. Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> as far as follow-up goes, you know, I mean, just because again, this is, and this is one of those things that is kind of starting to blend a little bit when we're talking about the response, let's, let's first kind of talk a little bit about the response time for an inbound lead, right. For, for a lead that's coming in. So how quick is it really? I mean, I've heard to anywhere from, Oh, somebody has got to be on within five seconds or five minutes or inside the first hour or whatever. Is there anything, is there any like real information that's out there that can be actually, that can actually be helpful to tell us how, like if, if we don't respond inside of this time, then we're starting to lose deals. Yeah. And there is, and, and, the, and the, the speed to lead or speed to response time, right? Speed to lead. Um, changes with the industries, right? If I'm selling a more commoditized item where I've got two or three choices and maybe it's a low barrier for entry, I can click, send my, put my credit card in and off I go, or even I can get a, a free demo of something, then the speed to lead, the speed response time is really important. You want to be part of that conversation before they make this decision in, in within the hour. But generally speaking, kind of in the B2B world, professional services world, within 24 hours, Ideally, same business day is best, but within 24 hours. Um, I would also say it, the response time shouldn't be predicated on your availability either. So if you've got a good CRM or a good um, marketing automation tool, when somebody says, contact me, schedule a download, whatever, or schedule a demo, create a download, you should have an autoresponder built into that workflow that says, hey, Ian, thanks for downloading the white paper. Thanks for requesting a demo. We hear you. We'll be, you know, um, Monica will be in touch with you in the next 24 hours. Make it human, put a name and a face to it and mm -hmm. tell them what to expect. Then they're not hanging on like, did that even go through? I clicked the button. Did it even, did they? Are they listening? <laughs> so have a, have, that's just part of the follow-up process is have some automation built into that. Right. Then you, then you can follow up within hopefully the same business day. Sure, absolutely. And then how long should we be following up? And what, like, again, I know that this is gonna be kind of dependent upon industry and your own business, but just, you know, some guidelines as to maybe how to determine how long we should be following up or how many times is, you know, just kind of becoming the clingy X kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah, you, when they say no, it's that respond, is it no? Yeah, um, right. I think, again, I hate to always preface a response with it depends, but if it's, if it's, let's say it's a lead that's generated through your website, a request for a demo, that's, you need to, you need to stay on that, right? They, mm -hmm. they have a, a desire or a need. They've exchanged their contact information for an opportunity to see your application, your software. If you're in the consulting world and it's a referral, let's say, it may take a few reaches, right? It may take a few sort of outreaches to get that person to respond because they may not, the connected dots like Robin introduced me, but who I don't know who you. So you have to be a little more diligent. So I think um, you need to you need to reach out three times in the first week, mm -hmm. which seems pretty pretty maybe frequent. But think about your own personal inbox. How right. quickly does stuff get buried? Or it's like I'll get to that. So it's actually doing them a favor that you're staying top of mind. Mm -hmm. That you want to kind of close that loop and have that conversation so three times in the first week um, and then i would say weekly after that for a couple more weeks and and here's the thing don't wing it define right. your process script out your follow-up emails even better set them up in your crm so you can hit click and go right and then that mm. sequence happens automatically um, but if you're not quite that you know you're not quite there yet at least have them templated out so you don't have to think about it right mm -hmm. follow up number two boom out it goes follow up number three boom, yeah. out it goes. and you've got a process because process drives kind of consistency right um right. and then the 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 second week email is a little different and i have a sort of like a breakup email that i can use sometimes and it gets really good responses uh, i'm working with a client right now they sell they sell some software and the rep's been 
following up, following up, following up after this really energetic lead came in. And he's got no response. He's got, he's, he's ghosted. So I said, just send this. Have your priorities changed? He sent it out. He got an immediate response saying, thanks for asking. Yeah, we've shifted to a different direction. I want that. I, that's better than no, no information. Right. 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 Close them, qualify them out, move on with your life. So mm. script out your, your follow up emails. Um, but if you've gone a month, so you sent three emails in the first week and then weekly after that, if you've got nothing, I would put them into your nurture campaign. So you should have an email sequence that's twice a month for a period of three months. That's what I call a nurture campaign. And that really isn't it. Go and put them back at the beginning, starting to re-educate them on the value of what you do. Mm-hmm. It could be white papers. It could be um, industry information. It could be testimonials. It could be whatever you feel is the right content, but you want to re-nurture them. See if they engage in that nurture campaign and looking at your uh, marketing or email automation software, you can see who's opening and clicking through on those emails. Right. Maybe a way to re-engage them because maybe it's just bad timing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So get them into a nurture campaign after a month of re- outreach. You know, it's, you mentioned uh, a couple of things that you mentioned. First of all, that breakup email, right? Because a lot of people that I've talked to get really antsy with a breakup email because, you know, they haven't said no yet. So maybe it's a yes, right? And yeah. which I get, I mean, I get the impulse at least. I mean, but that seems to be something that that it's just... To, uh, with experience you kind of realize that that's just not the case right it's not and and the has your prior have your priorities changed or has mm-hmm. something changed is a really soft way because we're not looking for them to say i'm still interested in buying we're not looking for them to say leave me alone we just want a response are you still alive right mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so this has your priorities changed is a soft way just to get them to respond to you right and they feel it's, it's amazing a simple email like that you'll get some insight that you didn't mm. ask for directly. Yeah. You're not closing the file, right? The old school, we're just going to close a file on you. No. Yeah. You need to know. It just could be bad timing. So the priority question can really help. Yeah. And it's a hundred percent success rate, right? I mean, either they say no, let's let's talk again next week, and now you get another phone call, or they say yes, I'm not going to do it. Now you got your time back, or they just don't respond and you know that they're just not that in you anymore, right? So right. stick them in the nurture campaign and move right. on with your life. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing that, that does come to mind is that, you know, when we're talking about, because there are sales, you know, obviously, we have salespeople on here, and, yeah. you know, they may not be, they may not have access to, to, to their own, they may not be able to make their own decisions on automation or anything like that. But I've known plenty of people that just use, um, excuse me, people that are stuck in Outlook, for example, that yeah. are forced into using Outlook, because they're in the wealth management world, right. And, you know, they're, they're directed into Microsoft for whatever reason. Right. And uh, which, you know, my, my thoughts on that aside, you know, <laughs> there are ways you, in the, in Microsoft, you can create signatures, right. And then you can use that. You can create those templates and just write out a full email and as a signature and then boom, you've, you're not fully automated, but at least you're halfway there. Right. Absolutely. I mean, even if you've got a Word doc and you copy paste, right? Yeah. Whatever, whatever it takes to, if you can standardize 85% of that, mm-hmm. it's going to it's gonna happen more consistently. Yeah. Of course, you want to edit it, tweak it for that situation, but totally. Yeah. Don't overcomplicate it. If you don't have automation, this is really easy, but know your process right. and schedule those follow-ups too. So if you know you got a Monday, Wednesday, Friday follow-up from a lead that came in Friday, mm-hmm. Put them in your calendar, put them in your to-do list, whatever you, however you manage your time. I'm going to email Ian, email one, email two, email three, these dates, these times, and just, you know, be disciplined. Right. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about current client growth. That's uh, when we, obviously, I mean, that, it seems pretty obvious, but just to ask the obvious question, what do you like? Let's, let's kind of first define what we're talking about here. Yeah, I see we had a, a question come in from Robin. Do we want to hit that first? Oh, sorry, I missed that. How do you feel about just asking to confirm receipt of the email along with a commitment to call them if you don't get a response? Is uh, is Robin's question. So, um, so you're asking for two things in one email, mm-hmm. right? If you have you earned that right, that trust, that relationship to ask for it, right? So I would, to me, you're. That's that's self-serving. 
Right. It's self-serving. And, and they've got to feel like there's a reason for them to do that. So what you're doing is saying, if you don't email me back, I'm going to cold call you. I'm going to hit you up. Right? That's what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean to completely like, you know, tear Robin's idea apart, but they're not going to, they're not going to answer the phone. Sure. If that's what we're saying is, hey, Ian, let me know if you get this email. If you don't let me know, I'll give you a buzz. I wouldn't do it. I don't think no. that's the way to get response. So my email got... Yeah, I mean, authentic tone. It's hard to create, it's hard to com- um, communicate tone in an email, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it just is. So I would suggest if, if it's a true just being ghosted, go try it. Robin, try my idea out. Try the has your priority changed or has something changed email and see if you get mm. see if you get a response that way. It's hard yep. enough to get people on the phone. If they know you're gonna call and they don't want to answer, they're not gonna answer, right? That's true. I mean, everybody's got caller ID these days, right? And so, you know, I can look at my desk phone here and and see exactly who's calling me now. So yep. it's a it's 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 a different world than it's a different thing than it used to be. So it's true. Um all right. So uh Current client growth uh, again, pretty obvious uh, from the just just off the start. Is there anything you know? What are we missing? Are we what are we what, what are we talking about here? Um, I think there so there are two or three things. First is this concept of lifetime client value, right? Or client lifetime value mm-hmm. described both ways. And really, what it is, it's um, it's a combination of of three things: frequency, a customer buys from you the average value of each deal or sale and how long they stay, right? Those three components add up to maximizing the lifetime value of a client. Cause we all know it costs a lot more to get somebody in than to keep them and grow. Right. So that's what we're really talking about is ways to find opportunities to help them in a deeper or broader manner. That's the goal. You can't, again, the goal is not to sell them stuff they don't need. The goal is to really understand how we can expand. So if your client model or your client profile is um, smaller businesses, you may have some limitations to that, perhaps. If you're working with large global companies with lots of locations and divisions, you might have a lot more opportunity for growth. It really just depends on who who you're working with. But the goal is to understand the client at a deeper level Mm-hmm. and understand how you can add more value and quite honestly sometimes that additional value isn't revenue to you it's you referring them in or connecting them with another service provider that can solve that problem it's still value you're building equity in that relationship and i believe that always comes back around so high level that's what we're talking about okay um so this is intriguing that's you know i i, I like for a long time mission suite only had really one revenue model right really one revenue stream and you know there was specific reasons for that and you know like and all the, even though i knew that okay if this revenue you know it, not diversifying revenue is a challenge but you know i'm, I'm curious from both of those perspectives because to your point before if you have multiple opportunities to to make money off of a cl- off of one client then you're in a good position to to do to do things like that Right. But if you only have one way, so but if you only have one way of you know kind of bringing in revenue from a client, how are you kind of how are you able to grow uh, that 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 relationship? Yeah, yeah. So there are there are situations where you, you don't, you can't, mm-hmm. and so growth would be with maybe a referral or something else. Mm-hmm. But let's say let's take Mission Suite just as an example. Yeah, you know, soft, soft was on my mind for some reason. This right. Time. Um, you know, you you grow with a client as they add, as they grow their email database, right? That's your metric for growth. Right. And so what can you do to help them grow their email list? It benefits them to grow their email list. Mm-hmm. So maybe you have a, um, a low cost or even a free, perhaps, training course or right. webinar where you teach them how to grow their email list. It's a huge benefit, a tangible benefit to them. But as they hit that next tier, your revenue grows too. And you've added value to the relationship and they probably will stick with you longer. Mm-hmm. So that, that's one example. Um, I think the other one is um, expanding into new areas of the business. So if you're a consultant 
maybe you have a primary focus, maybe you're I don't know, a contract CFO, for example. Um, and usually, a lot of times, under that CFO role in businesses, HR, IT, some other random departments fit. Maybe there's an opportunity for you to expand your services and bring in that fractional HR person when you see there's a need. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sometimes you have to get creative. But the, the, the truth is, is that the more you know about their business and their future plans, the better position you're in to grow with them. Mm -hmm. and or not get bumped out by the competition that's done the extra work to get to know them because you know no no client is locked in for life we know that right sure so one way one great way to do that is to do regular um regular client reviews i think mm -hmm. that's an easy one to to do is just to make sure that you are doing regular reviews with your client um whether it's like at the end of a project the end of a phase the end of the calendar year quarterly sit down with them and, and get to know what's going on in their business. Again, you may know, you may not know. You, if you don't spend the time, intentional time, you're probably missing opportunities. So that's that's an that's one way um, to grow or to find opportunities to grow that account. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this: I've you know I've known people in the consulting space who are really hesitant to go outside of their kind of outside of their bubble and their their core area of expertise. Um, because it starts to feel like you're trying to be all things to all people, right? I mean, you and I have a mutual friend back in San Diego, uh, Jim Tenuto, who always used to make the joke that the answer is money. What's the question, <laughs> right? And uh, of course, no consultant no, uh, wants to kind of come across that way. No, no salesperson really wants to come across that way. Um, and so how do you avoid kind of being that, uh, being that, or looking like you're trying to be like you're trying to be all things to all people yeah well i think it has to make sense right it just mm -hmm. has to make sense within your either skills or confidence or abilities and it has to make sense to the client right if i started talking to clients about supply chain and how i can help them buy stuff cheaper it doesn't make any sense right it, it's just like this big disconnect so it has to make sense um if you're not confident in doing that work yourself, uh, but you're confident in referring in, you know, subject matter experts con that can solve the problems you've helped identify, what if you set up strategic partnerships, affiliate relationships with these people, where you get a little bit of revenue, a referral fee, if you will? Some people are comfortable with that. Some are not. Some are willing to pay. Some are not. And it is really dependent on the situation. But I've seen that work really well. Um, but you have to have that confidence that they can deliver because they are also sort of representing you and your brand as well. Right. So there's that. I would say the other thing is, is keeping in mind the level of service that you're currently offering. You may have a kind of a do it yourself offer where you come in, you train them on something and they have to go do it themselves. Maybe you have a more of a done for you offer where you're coaching, consulting, but they're really doing the work. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can offer a done for you service where you actually do the work or you have a team that does that work. Yeah. That's sort of like this ascension model. Each, each level has a higher touch point, a higher value and a higher price point too. So mm -hmm. really think about the level of service. And is it, is it done for you or done with you done with you or done for you services, which is where most consultants sit. Um, do you have a way to add on an extra value layer to your services as well by just taking the whole problem off their plate? Mm -hmm. yeah it's another way to grow yeah very cool um so keeping uh continuing on down this list and let's talk a little bit about one of my favorite things uh referrals and an active yeah. referral program yeah so i, I may have you chime in as much as yeah. you, want. You, <laughs> you you do a lot of referral program uh education and yeah. great stuff so I think the key here is the difference between passive referrals and active referrals, mm -hmm. right? So a passive referral is you just out meeting people or Zoom meeting people, just collecting business cards and collecting LinkedIn connections. And you hope that somebody says, I remember you, dude, I'm going to introduce you. That's passive. Right. And right. will that result in some referrals? Yeah, probably at some point down the road, if you're lucky. Yeah, right. But an active referral program is completely different, right? Again, preaching to the choir with you and many of the people. <laughs> to that. Having a plan, right? I, I really think that it starts with understanding the profile of your ideal referral partner. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It has somewhat less to do with what they do, like their profession, and more to do with who they are. Some people are natural connectors and natural givers and are looking for opportunities to support. Mm-hmm. That, that It's really hard to teach that because it takes effort. Right? Yeah. So finding those people and then also identifying the individuals or the roles that are having conversations at the right level within your client's organization. Mm-hmm. So if you're networking with people that are talking to, I don't know, manager level employees, but you have to sell to the CEO or the C-suite, they may not be the right referral partner for you. Right. So that's all part of developing this referral um, profile. Mm-hmm. But that's the first part. Just figure out who the heck you need to build relationships with. Yeah. Um, and we all, we've all been through this, right? I think probably everybody in the call can raise their hand and say, when I started out, I met with everybody. Mm-hmm. Right? Death by coffee, coffee meeting. <laughs> and, and, and it re- resulted in very few referrals. So start there, start with that getting clear. Um, part of building your referral bench, your, to use your vernacular, right? Your referral partners mm-hmm. is, is then to find those individuals that fit that profile. And you can do it a lot of ways, right? You can just meet a lot of people and, and kind of filter them down. I found one of the best ways to find great referral partners is to ask great referral partners right. what they know. You're right. Like attracts like. You yeah. can certainly go, you know, onto LinkedIn and search t- um, certain types of profiles or, or roles or jobs and connect online. That expands geographically. Usually expands your referral partner reach. So those are those are all part of it. Then it's like now you've built some people in your your um, referral bench, if you will. Then you have to have a, a a process for following up and staying in front of them. Right. Again, Mission Suite's got it all built in. I don't keep need me to keep pitching Mission Suite, but any of your tools, automation. I'm not going to stop you from pitching no, Mission Suite, no, by no. the way. You know, I mean, go ahead. You know, <laughs> any use any tool you like, right? Yeah. To make sure you've got your outreach and your follow up schedule, right? That's right. really important. Building relationships. I, I think you need to meet your new referral partners monthly for six months. Mm-hmm. That's just my kind of go to. If you really click, you really hit it off. Maybe you can spread it out a little bit, but generally speaking monthly for six months, and then you spread it out from there. That frequency of FaceTime is, is really, really important. And then when you meet your referral partners, what do you say? I think it's your job to become easily referable, mm-hmm. right? I, I've talked about this before. There are some amazing consultants out there, but I really don't fully get what they do. <laughs> if I can't you know, describe it myself, how the heck am I going to refer them in? Right. So as, as the person hoping to receive referrals, simplify what you do. Talk When you meet with your referral partners, share, share wins, share stories, share examples. One of the best examples you can share is I had a lead come in. They asked for this thing. Here's the process we went through. Here are the questions I asked. Here's how they responded. Here's what we did for them. And here's the result. Mm-hmm. That just paints the whole picture to that referral partner of how they can do the same thing. Right. Yeah, of being active in, and really integrating into that person's thought process. Mm-hmm. Um, so fundamentally, start there. I mean, there's other things that we can talk about, but referral partner pro, uh, a profile, find the people that fit, get in front of them regularly, uh, um, share those stories, but also ask those questions. Ask questions of them. The more you can ask and understand of them, the easier you can refer. And, and one of the things that I really believe is important is be the first to give. Right. So after that first meeting, find somebody to connect them with. It doesn't have to be a client prospect. It can be another referral partner. Sometimes that's actually more powerful. Do that as soon as you finish meeting with them the first time. And then do it again right before you meet them the second time. Right. How much, you know, relationship equity have you built? Then they're going to feel like they owe you. And and why you don't want to manipulate the relationship? Maybe they do. Right? Sure. You want them to be active in, in connecting you as well. So just some thoughts about an active referral program. What, what do you have to add to that, Ian? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, you hit a lot of the you, you hit a lot of the key points, right? Uh, a lot of things that I talk about a lot, a lot of things that I that I try to teach. You know, a couple of things that uh, that do come to mind here as far as 
um, you know, because we all know, kind of like you mentioned, we can, you can network yourself out of a job, right? I mean, you can just go and have coffee after coffee after coffee after coffee after coffee, and that you know, and then it just it'll it'll kill you. Um, even if you just, I've known people who say, "Hey, Wednesdays are my networking days," and I'm like, "Man, how much coffee do you end up drinking on Wednesday?" You know, that's just that's that's crazy, and uh, and so. You know, if, but whatever you're doing, if you're doing too much of it, it's good. It's going to it's going to overpower you and it's, it's going to it's going to take over you. So I like to make sure that that I have different, you know, I've got different levels of, you know, like the ABC kind of a thing. And, you know, Dean mentioned the referral bench uh, and, you know, like the, which is kind of a concept that I came up with a while ago. It's basically. I've got my home play partners and they're like, you know, it's like Dean and me. Right. I mean, realistically. Dean and I would can can potentially touch on each other's business and every and every conversation that we have because we're both talking about sales and marketing we're both talking about process we're both talking about increasing revenue whether or not there's an opportunity for referrals is a different story but at least we're both in a position where we're having that conversation but um but you know that's kind of that uh, that home plate and every play there, at every turn there's a play right i mean there's 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 that opportunity um, and then the infield, which is kind of, you know, your similar people, similar conversations and or the outfield, whatnot. And but I like to make, you know, you mentioned the, the meeting with people once a month, those are, that that frequency I tend to reserve for that uh, that home plate that, you know, kind of ideal partner. And then uh, and then, you know, every three months for the other folks, every, you know, probably every half year or so for for that for the outfield. But kind of gives it gives you a way to 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 keep control of your time, I guess, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, those 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 A level referral partners will have whatever you want to do. Right. To them. You find that you interact with them far more anyway. Right? Yeah. You've got yeah. mutual clients in common. You've got opportunities in common. You're working together on stuff. So it's really easy to stay in front of many mm -hmm. of those. But then what happens is your focus for the rest of the group dwindles right. because you're only focused on that small handful. Right. So having that list, I kind of think of it of ABC. You know, you've got maybe 10 or 15 at A, maybe 30 at B and all the rest of C, and mm -hmm. they kind of move around. Yeah. But again, having a methodology, I think, is important. Right. Um, I think the other thing about referrals is you've got these referral partners, but there's another level that I, I think about, which is, what I call the strategic partner. Sure. And a strategic partner is not just somebody that you kind of refer back and forth, but instead of selling sort of selling to their clients, like they refer you, whatever, this is a sell with potential right. opportunity. So where you've got combining services, perhaps you've got a mutual offer that you can go to the market with. That's the next level, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can create some strategic partnerships Obviously, you've got to have similar kinds of client bases and, and similar values and all of those things. That's the next level again, right? Because yeah. if you're that's very active and intentional, and you're driving business with a with sale versus a, just a, a following up on a referral, you know, and that could be a co-marketing opportunity, it could mm -hmm. be a co-presentation, maybe there's some kind of financial affiliate relationship. You can work those things out. Some industries obviously limit what you can do in sure, terms sure. of sharing revenue, but you know, a sell with opportunity, you could still sell the combined package and have two different contracts with the client. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. And, you know, it's interesting. So, and you've been a guest on the referral bench podcast. And uh, one of the other guests that we've had is a guy by the name of Craig Jones, who's a wealth manager here in town. And he mentioned that, you know, he's worked with, he said he's got a couple of referral partners that he's worked with for so long and he talked about this on the podcast, which is the only reason I'm talking about it now. But uh, but he's worked together with these folks for so long that event, ultimately now they're they're kind of they're coming together once a month to say, okay, what can we present together and to whom to create that kind of strategic partnership? Cool. Right? Yeah, that's a true strategic partnership. That's exactly yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so the, you, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say that the last thing that I that that I like to make sure to 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 point out to people when I'm talking about referrals is to not keep score right because <laughs> yeah. that yeah. can be hugely detrimental like you know if your people if the people that you're are that are in your referral network you know if someone's just not interested in giving you referrals right you figure that out right yeah. and if you don't then you should have a conversation with dean or me because we can help okay. you get there but uh but you know it's gonna be it's gonna get to be pretty obvious that they're just not interested in doing it and that's okay right then remove them 
but for the rest of them, you know, like I know for it's a perfect example is is me and anybody else that I that I that I refer to in the sales and marketing space, because once somebody has a CRM, they're not looking to change unless right. they're looking to change, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. I'm going to get significantly fewer referrals from any of my referral partners be, for that reason, right? Because it's not like, oh, you should change CRMs. That's a good idea. I'm going to look into that, right? That just doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. It's, man, Salesforce is killing me. I'm spending way too much money. It's not working out that well. And so I need something new. That's when all of a sudden there becomes a there becomes an opportunity, right? Whereas, you know, I mean, I'm able to I, like I'll be having a conversation, some and you know, somebody will be like, "Man, my sales guy is just not doing it," or I need to find a sales guy, or I need to figure out what my process is going to be, right? I can I can point them to you at any time and say, "Go talk to Dean." You know, even if they're already working with somebody else for some for for something else, right. right? I can say, you know, like, listen, this is, you know, he's a guy that can help you kind of that. Even if you need to silo him into this one little thing, he can help you figure this thing out, right? So, so understand that that's entirely possible that you'll give more than you get, and that that's okay, right? And because it, if you're trying to keep score and you're trying to trying to account for, oh well, you know, I sent him ten and he only sent me one. And well, you're then you're you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, you are and disappointment for sure. Right, right exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good point. I I really think that if if you're in it to add value, mm -hmm. that's the reason you make the referral. Good stuff comes back, whether you believe in karma or not. Right. It ha it, and it may not come back from that person. It comes back from somebody else or something mm -hmm. else happens. So you put the good energy out into the world and you do the right thing consistently. People take notice as well. They right. really do. Right. So I have one other quick thing on referrals. The yeah. third bucket is client referrals. Sure. So how can you make it easy for clients to refer? And it's not the, can you give me the name of three people that you know right now before I leave the office? And work it anyway, right? Don't do that. Um, but if you've delivered great service, you've built a great relationship and you can have a conversation about business. You know, so many of my clients will ask me, how's your business going? What are mm -hmm. you doing? Because I care about them and they care about me. And it makes it really easy to say, you know, what? it's great. I'm actually out looking for a couple more clients. They're going to be proactive in helping you, right? Because you're friends, you're connected. So make it easy for clients to refer. I was looking at different um client referral programs, just, just out of curiosity to see what was out there. Mm -hmm. And um, Tesla has this interesting um, client referral program. Of course, it's consumer products, but nonetheless. Sure, uh, so every Tesla owner can give a friend up to $1,000 in discounts on their purchase of a Tesla. What a great referral program, right? So if I refer, I'm a Tesla owner, I refer you and you buy a Tesla, you get a $1,000 discount. Wow. Yeah. And then I get entered into this drawing for this super duper roadster Tesla. And every <laughs> quarter they give away one of these roadsters to one yeah. of their clients who made a referral. Now you've got to adapt that obviously to your world and your business, but one of the best places to communicate with clients, if you have a place where your clients log in to your website, your software, your portal, whatever it is, most of the time, that real estate's not being used well. I was looking at a client yesterday. They're, they're a fulfillment um, company. They do you know, manufacturing, distribution, all that stuff. And they've got a, a pretty good website. We're doing some updates to that and the messaging. But we went to their like client login page where every client has to go to see the status of their order. And it's this generic image in the background and this teeny tiny little login box with nothing, nothing right. on there. Like, well, first of all, it doesn't look like your website. That's a problem. That's a place to communicate with your clients. If you want a client to see something, put it in a place where they go, where they have to go. Yeah. It's the login page. So maybe you run a referral program, you drop a testimonial, you give an update, have something short and snappy on that page. They will probably read it. So sometimes it's just as easy as communicating with clients, but don't forget that's the third bucket of referrals is your client base. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we got about 10 minutes left here. So let's talk a little bit about the email list and database. Yeah, we kind of rambled on about referrals. <laughs> and um, we could go a lot longer too. <laughs> yeah, true. All right, so emails and database. So think in terms of, so we're talking about the pillars of revenue generation. The things you have control over 
to drive impact in your business. And now let's take a step back and think about email versus even though social media is in the next section, I'm going to use that. If you're building your presence and your lead gen and your interaction with your market on social media only, you're risking your business because those are really rented spaces, right? You have no control if Instagram just says, Ian, I don't like, look at your face, dude, and I'm shutting you down. It happens all the time. Yeah. All social media platforms, you're renting space in their world. You don't own it. You don't really, own, you don't even really own the content once you've posted it. You know, it's out there in, in the world. So don't get sucked into all things social all the time. I'm not suggesting don't do social because you do need to do social. But build your email list because you own that list. If you're building that list, you own that list. And hopefully you own the relationships that are connected to those email addresses. Mm -hmm. So have two things going. One is have a list building activity. And you can go back to some prior community table uh, episodes. We talk a lot about evergreen and content and lead magnets. But right. have something of value some little piece of premium content. It could be a download. It could be a workshop, a webinar. It could be a video, something that you know that your primary prospects want to know. Mm -hmm. Little inside scoop, a little free advice. Productize that. Make it a PDF. Make it a video. And tell people about it. And then they exchange their email address for that piece of premium content. Mm -hmm. That's the simplest way to build your list. So if you're not building your email list consistently, you need to think about how you can do that. So that's number one. And the second is, if you've got a list, it's just like a plant or a tree. If you don't nurture it, it will die. Yep. So have a plan for consistently using that list. You don't want to sell every time you send an email out. That's not good. But if you step back and think about who, who do I get emails from that I really enjoy? I'm like, when Ian doesn't send that thing, I want to know why. I want to, Ian, why are you not sending that email this week? Do you have people that you wait for that email to come in weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever it is? And look at the content. Look at the kind of information they're sharing, the format that they're sharing. And can you replicate that in your own world? Mm -hmm. Usually email content newsletters, if you will, that are really in high demand are short and fairly frequent, right? Right. It can be really well designed or it can be just simple plain text, whatever you want, doesn't matter. But short, frequent emails with always trying to communicate value is a way to nurture that email list, engagement with that email list and experiment, right? Use your marketing automation tool, use your email automation tool and see what kinds of content gets open and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. When you link stuff, are you linking with a button or a hyperlink? What cl gets clicked on? So experiment with the content. So email list, build it and nurture it. And if you nurture it, you can make sales pitches then because you've, yeah. built, you've built credibility. There's, um, there's a guy down in the Springs that sends out probably two or three emails a week. They're always, they look kind of plain text style, mm -hmm. but he's always telling a story. Oh, it's just funny. His email just came in. It caught my eye on my phone. <laughs> Um, that's really funny. Um, plain text, fairly short, tells stories about his family, tells stories about his clients, tells stories about his kids. But there's a moral. And that moral to the story usually is some kind of a download this thing to help solve your business problem. It's free. Or here's my offer this week. Sure. It never feels salesy and pitchy. And I kind of know he's going to do it. That's all right. I still enjoy reading the emails. Yeah. So that engagement is critical with email lists. So mm -hmm. build that database, build that list, have a plan to do so. If you have questions on um, lead magnets and sort of premium content, reach out to me, I'm happy to chat. Um, but don't live in somebody else's rented condo. Yeah. Right? They can take the keys away. Make sure you own, own one of your, your channels, which is your email channel. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, people used to look at social media as building the well, right? And they right. continually dip into, and then Facebook made their first uh, set of changes to how they publish organic uh, and unpaid uh, content. And next thing you know, everyone's realizing, oh, wait, it's not an actual well. There's <laughs> Actually, not only there, there's no water there, right? I mean, so you know, yeah, yep, yeah. But uh, yeah, well, I guess more accurately, they can just keep shrinking the well. Yeah, uh, or yeah. you have to pay 
to be able right. to dump a bucket in there, right? That's yep. that's another thing. LinkedIn has done a bunch of changes and continues to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, Instagram is coming out with a whole different way. They're going to sort of show content in their feeds. You need to know that stuff. You need to be active yep. in the right channels, but don't just don't rely on it, guys. It's going to it'll, it'll kill you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and the last thing here is digital marketing and social media. Speaking of LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll, we'll hit the headlines on this one. Um, we're not going to get into sort of our paid ads and all of that digital marketing stuff. Just just think in terms of digital outreach, right? You can use web. Um, you certainly can do paid advertising and social media. The first thing I would say is that there was this whole ebb and flow with this concept of um, social selling. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of an oxymoron there, right? People are on social to be social. They don't want to be sold and pitched to. And I think during the pandemic, LinkedIn swung heavily to pitch. You connect and somebody pitches your stuff. Yeah, It doesn't work, right? So in terms of social selling, it does work. But the part you do on social is social. It's mm. connecting. It's building relationships. It's building thought leadership. And then you move them off of social to have a deeper, more specific conversation that's the part that often gets missed you see the instagram influencers and they sell bunches of stuff whatever right that's one percent of the one percent who cares right, you right. and i and the rest of the people on the on the um call today that's not going probably going to happen too often mm-hmm. so use social to build thought leadership and relationships if you add enough value you can connect with those people and get them to integrate or interact with you somewhere else email call webinar, whatever. So social selling does work. Just don't sell on social. Right. That's my, my first little kind of point. The other is content, content, content. This ever challenging um, sort of strategy around um, SEO, search engine optimization, getting people to find you online. One of the best things you can do is post blog posts on your website regularly. Mm-hmm. A couple of times a month, ideally, I mean, if you've got the bandwidth weekly, that's hard to do um, because every time you post a new new blog post on your website, it's a new web page that Google gets to index. And if you've optimized that content for the right search terms that people look for to find your stuff, it increases your SEO significantly. Mm-hmm. So the beautiful thing is, is that if you write a blog post, that can become a script to your video. And it can be broken into a bunch of small social media posts and your video can be broken up into snippets. And all of a sudden you've got a couple of weeks worth of content yeah. from one blog post. Right. So that repurposing on digital and social is really important. So people struggle with content. They struggle with SEO. And what are people searching for? And how do I, what do I do? So everybody write down this website. It's also asked.com. So A L S O. A-S-K-E-D.com. I'll just drop it in the chat. Also asked.com. What this website does is it will show you what people are searching for. So you start putting in general terms that your business can help solve. It's going to show you the search volumes and what people are searching for and the sort of the, the path they go through. So maybe they're searching for CRM. It's a big, broad topic. You can click through and get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then you can create content around what people are actually searching for. It's almost buyer intent research. So social selling, don't sell on social, but you can sell on social or with social. And regular blog posts that are SEO optimized. Those are my two big things that I see most people missing that are low hanging fruit when Mm -hmm. it comes to revenue. And by the way, all that stuff is also great, great for your email list, right? Great to, for email nurture. If you're, if anybody here is on my, the mission suite journal, uh, email list and, you know, every week you get the, you get the, the email that has the latest YouTube video and the, the link to that. And you've got the, you know, whatever the next community table session is going to be a link to the podcast, you're like all those things it's all happening anyway. Right. I mean, it's all content that we're making. So it's all going out to the email list. And that way I don't have to think about, well, what, what's going to be my next email. It's already done for me. It's all built in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So those are my five recommendations or what they will all impact your revenue moving forward. So go through the list. If you have questions, reach out. Um, mm-hmm. But very few businesses I work with are doing all five of these or even doing all five poorly. They're just not doing all five consistently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much. We are uh, here at 2.59. So uh, I think we did pretty well uh, overall. Um, but uh, but yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much for being here. Dean, thank you. As always, it's uh, enlightening and a great conversation. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on uh, Facebook, <clears throat> on the Mission Suite pages. I will also include uh, a link to that uh, also asked.com in the in the in the comments of Facebook in the description of the YouTube video so that you can get to that as well. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being here. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your week and a phenomenal 2022. And we will see you next month. All right. Thanks, cheers. Everyone. Take care. Bye.